Science involves recording information about what we observe in the world around us, and then using that information to try to figure out what has happened, is happening, or will happen in the future. If we don't record our observations properly, then it's hard to use these records to make inferences. In this video, I describe the topic of measurement in research design. I'll explain what's involved in forming, formulating a measurement strategy and why this phase of developing a research project matters. Let's begin by reviewing how measurement fits into the larger scheme of conducting scientific research. Science generates and tests theories. A theory is an explanation of how the world works, and it has two parts. It has concepts, which are ways that we describe or categorize people or things around us, and relationships, which are links between concepts. In relationships, we postulate that the presence or absence of one concept will influence the presence or absence of another. Let's try to be more concrete. Religiosity is an example of a concept. It classifies people according to the degree to which religion is central to the way they think and behave. We use the concept of religiosity to classify people into groups, perhaps those who are very invested in religion, those who are mildly invested in it, and those who aren't invested in religion at all. Another example is the concept of criminality. It's a concept in which we categorize people according to the degree to which they are willing to break the law. We use this concept to categorize people as well. We might divide them into people who have a high willingness or tendency to break laws, and those who are unwilling to do so. Theories are concepts linked by relationships. So for example, we might theorize that the degree to which someone is religious affects the degree to which they're criminal. If the relationship between religiosity and criminality is negative, in other words, as one becomes more religious, one becomes less criminal, then we'd expect religious people to be less likely to break the law, and non-religious people to be more likely to break the law. Now a theory without evidence is little more than a guess. It's not scientific. To test this theory scientifically, we have to find a way to figure out who's more or less religious and who's more or less criminal, and then see if the people who are more religious are less criminal and the people who are less religious are more criminal. This recording process is called measurement. When we measure, we keep records of our subjects, thoughts, behaviors, or personal characteristics. We look for relationships between these measurements to see if relationships exist. So in this particular example, developing a measurement scheme involves figuring out a way to determine whether or not someone is more or less religious and more or less criminal. How could we do it? If we were conducting this study using a survey, which is not necessarily the best way to do it, we might ask our respondents directly, are you religious or are you criminal? The problem with asking questions directly is that people might have an inaccurate view of themselves. They might over or underestimate the degree to which they're religious, and they would probably underestimate the degree to which they're criminal. If we wanted to get around this problem, we might ask people to report events in their past instead of making global assessments of their character or lifestyle. For example, instead of asking how religious are you, we might ask how often do you attend religious services, and assume that people who go to religious services more often are more religious. Likewise, instead of asking, are you a criminal, we might ask, how often have you been arrested or have you ever been arrested, and presume that people who've been arrested are more criminal. Now these strategies have weaknesses of their own, and all strategies that collect information like this through surveys have to deal with the problem that respondents might 
report inaccurate information. They might lie or they might have personally distorted information in their own minds and are conveying that distorted worldview back to you. We could use other types of questions or we might use a different method for collecting data. For example, I might go visit some staunchly pro and anti-religion people and have extended discussions with them. I could take detailed and extensive notes which try to capture the many uh, things that were said or things that I saw that could help me put together a larger picture of the complex relationship between religion and criminality. The pitfalls here are that it would be hard for someone else to check my work and there'd be lingering questions about whether or not I was seeing my subjects as they really were or looking at them in a way that that more strongly reflects my personal biases than what these people objectively think or do. Whether we're talking about survey questions and quantitative research or note-taking strategies and qualitative research, researchers have to figure out a way that they're going to take information about what they observe and put them into records. This process of record-taking and classification is known as a measurement strategy. My main point in this video is that measurement is not simple. Often, when students get a research project, they think that they have a pretty good handle on the questions that they want to ask, and they go right to drafting up a survey, and then come up to me and ask if they can start collecting data. Running through that process is dangerous. There are lots of pitfalls that you can fall into when you're developing a measurement strategy. So it's important that you do it carefully and with a cognizance of the strengths and the weaknesses of the method that you choose.